Let's talk about the central nervous system. This is what most people think of when they think of the nervous system. It's the brain and the spinal cord. So the central nervous system, um, let's talk about the brain first. We're talking about cerebral hemispheres, that is, the two halves that make up the upper portion of the brain. Diencephalon, which is an area deeper into the brain. The brain stem and the cerebellum, which is a separate kind of extra brain at the base of the skull. Now, the cerebral hemispheres, the brain is divided into right and left parts, um, paired right and left, superior parts of the brain. It's about half of the brain mass, and it has lots of grooves and ridges, and the grooves are called sulci, and the ridges are called gyri. Now, if you were to cut into a brain, what you would see is the cerebral cortex, the cortex being the outer part, or outer part, which consists of gray matter. And gray matter is made up of nerve bodies, um, unmyelinated cells, and dendrites, basically. It's a couple of millimeters thick. It contains billions of cells. And these ridges, these folds, give the brain more surface area. So we can have more cells packed into a smaller area. Now, interesting thing here. Um, the male brain is slightly bigger than the female brain, but the female brain has deeper folds. So they have the same number of cells. It is just more efficiently packed. Now, it grows very quickly, of course, the brain does, so it ends up with these fissures. There are some animals, like the koala bear, that do not have this kind of structure. They have what they call a smooth brain, which means they're not really that good at the thinky-thinky parts. Now, there is a big deep fissure that separates the left and the right side, and the two halves of the brain do communicate with each other. There is a band of white matter, which is uh, made up of myelinated fibers, which crosses from one to the other and allows them to talk to each other. Each hemisphere is divided into four lobes, which we will discuss in just a little bit. Now, the distribution of gray and white matter is a little bit different between the spinal cord and the brain. The gray matter in the spinal cord is located in this central H-shaped structure, with white matter being uh, tracks, sensory tracks and motor tracks, located on the outer portion. Inside the brain itself, the gray matter is on the outside, with the white matter located on the inside. And we also have some little structures that are gray matter located within the white matter, which we will talk about as well. Now, in terms of white matter distribution and the way that it functions, the white matter is what communicates between one cell and the other. And so we have these bands of white matter, and some of them just go, like this one here, from one of the gyri to the other. And that's called an association fiber. So we have different parts of the brain that process different things. So we have these different um, pathways. So when I'm hearing something, I have to take what I'm hearing, which is in the temporal lobe, and I have to move it to the frontal lobe so that I can understand it. So, we have those. We have commissural fibers, which are right here, and this is the band that we call the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum, again, um, goes from one side to the other. And then we have projection fibers that actually extend outward and go to the cranial nerves and the peripheral nervous system. Now, these peripheral nervous system, uh, these projection fibers actually cross and as a result the right side of the brain takes care of the left side of the body. The left side of the brain takes care of the right side of the body. Now just in terms of, uh, of the lobes of the nervous system, we have a frontal lobe 
that's the frontal part of the brain located here. We have a parietal lobe, which is up and toward the back, a temporal lobe located here, and an occipital lobe located in the back. Each of these lobes has different functions. So let's take a look at the different functions that we're talking about. Now, let's take another look at these in a bigger picture. You can see these structures. There are specific sulci that separate these structures. So this precentral gyrus, that takes care of a lot of motor activity. This postcentral gyrus takes care of a lot of sensory activity. And yet another picture of the brain. So what does each lobe do? Well, the frontal lobe has motor impulses for voluntary movement. So I choose to move my arm from side to side. That is happening in the frontal lobe. This is also where my intellect is. Um, higher thought processes. And my ability to speak and understand speech. Because there is a motor activity associated with that. That also ties to the frontal lobe. And there is thought that goes into the words for some people. Well, not everybody thinks about it as much as others. Um, the parietal lobe, general sensory area, and the ability to taste things. The temporal lobe is the ability to smell and the ability to hear. And occipital lobe has visual areas. So we'll go into more depth on what we can do here, but looking at this thing, which is called a homunculus, which is, shows the distribution of um, the amount of the brain or nervous system associated with different actions. And we've got the motor area, again, that is just the posterior of the frontal lobe. And then we have the sensory area, which is the anterior of the parietal lobe. And as you see here, we have a lot of the brain associated with the head and neck region and tongue. Um, so we are able to control the facial expressions very well. A lot of communication actually happens through facial expressions. We have a large motor area for our hands because we are very dexterous. We can manipulate things very well. But we don't have a whole lot of model motor control over the torso because we don't need it. I mean, what does the torso do? It bends forward, it bends back, side to side, but there's not a lot of complicated movement associated with the torso or the trunk or the hip, um, knee or toes. Those are simple types of movements that we make. Now, in terms of sensory, we have a lot of sensory in the eye, nose, and face. And that makes complete sense because we have our sensory organs, vision, smell, taste, all of that. And we need this area to be well protected. So it is very sensitive. So we're going to respond very quickly if something touches us, you know, in the face. Um, we become very aware of it very quickly. We have less sensation in the feet and the torso and the back of the head, but again, we have fairly good sensation in the hands. Now, we do have some specialized areas of the cerebrum, you know, primary somatic sensory areas. You're not going to need to know much about these. Um, just know that we have sensory areas located in the parietal lobe, which receives impulses from body sensors. And then we have the primary motor area, which is located in the frontal lobe. We also have two areas associated with speech, which are Broca's area and Wernicke's area. These are well developed in humans. Um, other animals, not as much. The Broca's area and Wernicke's area isn't well developed in my dog. 
So my dog can understand maybe 200 words or commands. That's about what they think a dog can do. So it recognizes its name and then it hears yada, 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 yada. Meanwhile, we are able to have a vocabulary of thousands of words and understand their meanings because ours is better developed. We also have some specialized sensory areas. We've got a gustatory area, which is associated with taste. We have a visual area, which again is toward the back of the skull. Um, so our visual processing is back here. And that uh, makes it possible, actually, you can smack someone in the back of the head and it actually cause them to see stars. We have an auditory area, which is more toward the temporal lobe um, and the parietal lobes, and we have an olfactory area, so specialized sensory areas. And damage to these areas can impact what we taste. Um, we can have, if you have migraine headaches, that can impact the visual area, and you can see a halo around things or flashing lights. Uh, people can, if they develop a tumor, may have odd smells. You know, there are people who have complained of smelling peanut butter all the time, or burnt feathers, or something like that. And that's a good indicator that they've got something going on in that particular area of the brain. We have some interpretation areas as well. We've got speech-language interpretation regions, language comprehension, just general interpretation areas. So, you can see that we don't have the kind of diffuse activity all through the brain. We have some areas that do specified things, and we can actually determine where a stroke or brain damage has occurred by what kind of deficits a person has. So if a person had damage up here to Broca, Broca's area, they would have some difficulty with speech or understanding speech. If they had damage to the occipital lobe, they may have some visual disturbances. Um, damage to the sensory, they may discover they have some numbness somewhere, something like that. So, I did say that the skull is not just a diffuse sensation, we actually have um, hemispheric lateralization. That is, one side of the brain specializes in certain activities and the other side specializes in others. Um, left part of the brain deals with spoken and written language, but the right side of the brain deals with emotional content and emotional content of language. Right, uh, left side has numerical skills. Right side has musical and artistic awareness. Left side, ability to use and understand language. And again, right side, emotional content. And left side, reasoning. And general mental image and spatial relationships are on the right side. Now, this hemispheric lateralization is more pronounced in men. And that has to do a little bit with the structure, well, not a little bit, it has a lot to do with the structure of the corpus callosum. See, in men, that's a fairly thin band. And so the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain don't communicate with each other as well. Meanwhile, in women, the corpus callosum is about a quarter inch thick or so. So there's lots of communication going on in the right, between the right and left sides. This kind of actually explains some behavioral aspects of men versus women. We'll continue with this topic in the next video.